Hi everyone, we're talking about pinworms in this lesson. So we're going to talk about how we get infected by pinworms. We'll talk about some of the life cycle of how pinworms cause infection. We'll also talk about signs and symptoms, how they're diagnosed and how they're treated. So pinworms are also known by the scientific name Enterobius vermicularis. They are nematodes, which means they're roundworms. They'd be considered roundworms. And other roundworms would include things like Ascaris, threadworms, and others as well. And an infection by pinworms causes the condition known as enterobiasis, which we're going to discuss throughout this lesson. So pinworms are actually a common childhood infection. So especially young children going to school or going to daycare, being around other children, they're more likely to be infected, oftentimes due to sanitary issues. And along with children, young adults, so especially adults with young children are more likely to also have pinworm infections as well. Now, pinworms are more common in temperate regions of the world, and they're also more common in crowded living situations. So these things can include institutions or prisons, anywhere where there's a lot of people cramped together. And often if there's issues with sanitation, this makes it worse as well. And males are more likely to be affected than females. So males are twice as likely to have pinworms as female patients are. So now let's talk about what happens when we're infected by pinworms and then how we can pass the infection on to others. So if we're infected by pinworms, female pinworms are going to be the ones that are going to cause issues. They're larger than the male pinworms. And what happens is they were going to exit the anus at night and lay eggs on the anal perimeter. So they're going to use the end of their tail to deposit ova or eggs in and around the anal perimeter. And what's going to happen is that egg laying is going to cause irritation and pruritus or itching sensation. So it's going to be itching and kind of a prickly tingling sensation in the anal region, especially at night or early morning hours. Now, because of this irritation and the pruritus or the itching sensation, oftentimes the patient's going to itch or scratch at that location, and that's going to contaminate the surrounding environment. So the eggs can contaminate their clothing or contaminate the bedding or contaminate other parts of their surroundings. If they have the eggs on their hands, if they touch any objects in the environment, this can contaminate the environment. So furniture, bedding, clothing, toilet and doorknob can all be classic examples of places where we can have these little eggs in the environment. And one other point to make note of here is that the eggs can be transmitted during sexual contact as well, although this is going to be more rare. Once these eggs have been in the environment, they can be aerosolized, they can enter into the air if, for instance, you're moving bedding around, if you're changing bedding, the eggs can get into the air and can be breathed in by the patient, or a patient can touch some surface with the eggs and touch their mouth or put their fingers in their mouth and ingest the eggs. So this is how these eggs can enter into the patient. Then the eggs are going to enter into the gastrointestinal system. They're going to hatch and develop into adult pinworms. Now another way that eggs can infect patients is through auto-infection or what we would call retro-infection. So the eggs can be deposited by the female pinworm on the anal perimeter at night, and those eggs can hatch, and they often take some time to do this. They can take weeks. So if there's poor hygiene especially, these eggs can hatch, and they can enter into the anus and enter into the large intestine as a retro-infection. This is another way we can see infection with pinworms as well. And as we mentioned before, they enter into the gastrointestinal system and they reside in particular areas of the gastrointestinal system. These include the end of the small intestines where the small intestine meets the large intestine. This is the ileocecal area. This is where they can reside in. They can also reside in the appendix, in the cecum, and in the ascending colon as well. So these are the typical areas where these pinworms will reside. Now let's talk about the clinical features of having pinworms. So oftentimes these can be asymptomatic. You may have pinworms, but you might not know it. There's no signs or symptoms. So this would be considered asymptomatic carriers. In other cases though, even if there's no symptoms, we may be able to see the pinworms. The pinworms are large enough to be able to be seen by the naked eye. So after wiping, after a bowel movement, you may see these little pinworms. They can be as long as 10 millimeters. 
Now, if we do see symptoms, the typical symptom that we're going to see with pinworm infection is anal pruritus. So an itching sensation of the anus or the anal perimeter. Again, this is due to the egg laying by the female pinworm, especially at night or early morning hours. Oftentimes the anal pruritus, if it's going to be present, is going to be severe. So it's going to be very itchy. Again, we're going to see it worse at night or early morning. And we can also have prickling sensations or irritation of the anal region. Some other symptoms we can see with a pinworm infection include diarrhea. This is usually during the initial stage of infection. So it's an acute infection. Once you first get pinworms, you can have some diarrhea, but you can still be infected with pinworms. And oftentimes then you only have anal pruritus. And other symptoms that can go along with a pinworm infection include restless or difficult sleep. So due to that irritation of the anal region, this can cause issues with sleeping. Abdominal pain can also be something that can occur as well. And especially in children, there can be a passage of pinworms to the vaginal area. This can lead to a vaginal infection with pinworms leading to vaginal discharge. So we can see vaginal discharge with a pinworm infection as well. Now, there is another type of enterobiasis or pinworm infection that is more of an issue or more of a complicated case that is called ectopic enterobiasis. And this is mostly going to occur in immunocompromised patients. So patients with a compromised or deficient immune system. Patients who are very old, who have diabetes, who have HIV or AIDS, or patients who are on some medication that is suppressing their immune system, among other things that may compromise the immune system. And in the case of ectopic enterobiasis, the pinworms can migrate through the bowel wall. So due to that suppressed immune system, they can essentially get around the immune system, invade through the bowel wall, and enter into surrounding structures. So they can enter into the abdominal cavity, and this may be related to the reason why we may see higher levels of appendicitis in patients who have a pinworm infection. We talked about the fact that pinworms do reside within the appendix along with other areas. So having pinworms may actually increase your risk of appendicitis. Pinworms can also invade into the genital urinary system. So places like the vagina, the fallopian tubes, and the endometrium of the uterus. The liver can also be affected and the lungs can be affected as well, although this is going to be more rare as well. So how do pinworm infections get diagnosed? So diagnosis is going to be by microscopy, so using a glass slide to look at or visualize the eggs and the pinworms. So the eggs are going to look like this. And the way to do this is to actually take cellophane tape, apply it over the perianal region in the early morning hours. So this is the time when there's going to be the most eggs. So if you were to apply cellophane tape, you dab it on the perianal region, then apply it to the glass slide and look under a microscope. If you visualize eggs or pinworms, that is enough to make the diagnosis. If you don't get any visualization of eggs or pinworms, you continue to do the cellophane tape for five consecutive mornings. If there's negative findings for five consecutive mornings, this rules out infection. Once you've made the diagnosis, how do you treat it? So First, we'll talk about some preventative methods. So preventative methods include hand washing before eating. So if they are on hand, so if you're to touch a doorknob or touch the toilet or touch something else in the environment that has eggs and you were to touch your mouth or put your hands in your mouth or eat before ha hand washing, that's going to introduce those eggs into the gastrointestinal system. So it's best to hand wash before eating. So in any environment, especially in schools or in daycares, those types of things, so important to hand wash. Also important to do improved clothing and bedding hygiene as well. So a lot of times these eggs can get into clothing or bedding. So this can be a way to transmit this as well. So it's important to clean bedding and clothing frequently. Improved personal and family hygiene as well. So what can often be done is bathing upon awakening. So again, early morning hours are going to be the time when we're going to have the most eggs because those female pinworms are going to have laid eggs throughout the night. So those are some of the ways to prevent infection, but if we have an infection, how do we clear it? So medications are going to be used, so these can include mebendazole, elbendazole, or parental. So what normally is going to be done is that there's going to be an initial dose that's given plus another dose two weeks later. Even with treating these 
pinworms or this enterobiasis, reinfection is common. So even if you were to treat it, if there's eggs in the environment, you can be reinfected. Or if someone else is in your area or location that has pinworms themselves, they can reinfect you. So because of that, all individuals close to the patient should be treated simultaneously. So anybody in the same household should all be treated together. Or in a classroom where there is a pinworm infection or in a daycare, everyone should be treated together as well. So that is enterobiasis or a pinworm infection. If you want to learn more about other types of parasitic infections, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.